Hi, uh, uh, this is the Rockstar episode. Um, we're here to do a show. I just entered with a mask. Mask up, everybody. That's the best way we can protect ourselves and protect others. Uh, it's really important. No one's around. I'm in my studio. Everyone, you're all on the other side of Zoom, so I can take my mask off, but mask up. Hi, I'm Greg Bordowitz, and uh, this is the very first episode of Answers with Questions, and it's devoted to rock stars. What are rock stars? Why am I so preoccupied with rock stars? Well, I'm 56 years old, and I never grew up, I guess. Do they have rock stars today? I don't even know. I'm going to talk to you about rock stars from, that were important to me. Rock stars are profits. That's why I'm interested in them. Rock stars are profits. And profits aren't about the revelation of having contact with God. When you have contact with a prophet, you have, you have contact with someone who has sought and encountered the divine. You encounter the divine through the rock star because the rock star has access to cosmic divinity. They had the revelation. They witnessed the event. They put it into their lyrics. And you try to get as close to them, and that's how you get close to the divine. And the rock star doesn't lay down rules. It's not the instructions. The rock star, as a prophet, has divine pathos. Pathos, feeling, emotion, meaning. So who are the prophets for me? Patti Smith. Patti Smith is a prophet for me. People have the power. 1989, I was dreaming in my dreaming of an aspect bright and fair, and my sleeping, it was broken, but my dream, it lingered there in the form of shining valleys with a pure air recognized and my senses newly opened, I awakened to the cry. People have the power. Patti Smith is a prophet in the wilderness, in her dreaming, waking in the wilderness, she has this revelation, people have the power. Let's look at another one of my favorite prophets. Lou Reed. This is from the song, There Is No Time, 1988. So 1988, 1989, I am looking for rock stars. I am going to these concerts. Lou Reed is singing to us. There is no time, 1989. I went with my best friend, David Barr, to the Beacon Theater to hear Lou Reed and band deliver the New York album. And we thought it was for us. People have the power in 1989. We thought Patti Smith was singing to us, the AIDS activist movement. And I think they were. And you should ask, what are your artists delivering for you? What are your artists giving you in this time of need? That's a legitimate question. Lou Reed was singing to us. There is no time for celebration. There is no time for shaking hands. No time for black sap slapping. No time for marching bands. This is no time for optimism. This is no time for endless thought. This is no time for my country right or wrong. Remember what that brought. There is no time. There's no time for congratulations. There's no time to turn your back. There's no time for circumlocution. There's no time for learned speech. This is no time to count your blessings. This is no time for private gain. This is no time to put up or shut up. It won't come back this way again. There is no time. Lou Reed was a prophet. And sometimes prophets just go off into the mystical. There's no complete directive or imperative, like the driving force of there is no time. Purple Rain by Prince is a prophetic song. I never meant to cause you any sorrow. I never meant to cause you any pain. I only wanted one time to see you laughing. I only want to see you laughing in the purple rain. Purple rain, purple rain, purple rain, purple rain. Purple rain purple rain. I only want to see you underneath the purple rain. In the mist, in the haze, in the divine element, it's purple for Prince. 
thank you for the prophetic inspiration of rock stars. So to start off, we have some questions that were sent to us in advance, uh, particularly about rock stars and for the rock star episode. So the first question is, um, why take advice from rock stars? Why turn to rock stars now? Well, excellent question. Why turn to rock stars now? I've always spent time listening to music, pondering music, looking for direction. And it's not only what they say, it's how they say it. It's the grain of the voice. It's the emotion. It's the pathos. Uh, I'll go to the next question. Laura writes, Greg, years ago, I made the mistake of approaching one of my rock star idols, Kim Gordon, one of my rock star idols too, Laura, after a show and definitely I made a jerk of myself. Okay, so you approached Kim Gordon after a show, you made a jerk of yourself. Now you can't listen to Cool Thing without recalling this most embarrassing encounter. How can I recover? I hope you never recover. Feel that embarrassment. As a queer teenager uh, living out on Long Island, I came in with my best friend, um, Daphne uh, Fitzpatrick, who's actually an artist in the art world now. We went to high school together. She's the only person from high school that I'm in touch with. So Daphne and I used to come in from Long Island and go to the village to walk around. And we're walking down Christopher Street and I see Lou Reed. Lou Reed is walking down Christopher Street toward us. And I scream, I turn to Daphne and I grab her arm and I scream, Daphne, that's Lou Reed. He looked, he had terror in his eyes and he ran into a bar, not the Stonewall, but the one next to it, the Lion's Den, which was like this uh, bar where the voice writers used to hang out. And that was my chance. I could have like been so cool. I could have been, hey, Lou, like you're God to me or something like that. But no, I like, Daphne, that's Lou Reed. That's it. I, I, I didn't go into the lion's den. I didn't like pursue him. Um, Jay Lynn writes, how do I navigate the social awkwardness of Zoom? Well, I say dwell in the awkwardness of Zoom. Dwelling in awkwardness is dwelling in the divine. The divine is awkward. You don't feel comfortable in the divine. It's about transmission. Embrace the awkwardness of transmission. We're here stuck in these boxes. It's a pandemic. We're gonna have a show. Uh, I'm so happy that we're gonna uh, welcome prophet rock star Jasmine Niendi of the group Fuck You Pay Us, a modern day prophet delivering a punk message. I'm very happy to be here um, in my box. <laughs> We're going to welcome Jasmine Niende, who's the lead vocalist for Fuck You, Pay Us, uh, which is a great punk band. Uh, punk continues as a form. Jasmine, you are heading one of uh, the great punk bands of our moment. Um, I want to talk to you a bit about, uh, I want to welcome you. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, so happy to, to meet you and talk to you in this way. I've been listening to your music and you're making a tremendous contribution. You and your band are making a tremendous contribution culturally. Um, and I, I, I was wondering, cause I was reading and I wanted to ask you what, like, what does punk mean to you now as a, a maker of the music? Ooh, I would say punk means to me, trusting that inner voice that says that um, music your body, your life should be meant to be enjoyed for yourself and for your community, not just to work to make the largest system at be happy. So it's about listening to that part of you that's like, I like this sound that I made with my body and I'm gonna record it. And even if it's just for me, it's music. Instead of always being told what music is or being told what you should be doing with yourself, what you should be doing with your time. So I think punk is about that ethos of if it feels good to me, perhaps it'll feel good for somebody else. If it doesn't, fuck them. I'm just going my own way. Yeah, that's what's freeing about punk. And it's, it's what's freeing about being an audience and a fan of punk. Uh, 
because uh, I feel that uh, still at the age of 56, I feel that uh, whether I'm seeing a new punk band or listening to my old favorites, I still feel that license uh, to be me, you know? Uh, like for me in the, in the 80s in the East Village, punk was queer, right? Yeah. Uh, that wasn't foregrounded, but like we were there. And uh, there was all sorts of difference firing in the atmosphere at, uh, in the clubs that uh, hasn't been historicized as much as it should. Yeah. Um, and I think that, uh, I, I certainly think that Afropunk is making a great contribution as a cultural movement. I think so too. I think that it's um, providing space for people to really see that like, there is, there is an industry, there are other people like you, even the visibility of looking into a sea of other black people who are all moshing or dancing. And it's just, I think that it allows a lot more freedom that was desperately needed. And especially the archiving, archiving of that freedom. I think that's something that Afropunk does really well. Tell me then, how does that fit into the ethos of the name of your band, Fuck You Pay Us? What's the politics of that? So Fuck You Pay Us is something that's about reparations. It's about wealth distribution. It's about the way that we have to really respect the fact that musicians put a lot of work into what we do and we should be paid for it. It's about um, how fuck you pay us means fuck you pay independent artists, fuck you pay sex workers, fuck you pay um, people that you f pull inspiration from. Um, fuck you pay someone just because they are having a hard day. I don't know, it's like, think about the ways that we can redistribute. And so that's what fuck you pay us is. Thank you, Jasmine. Those were great answers. I could talk to you all day, uh, but it's we really have a job to do here. Uh, we're really here to give some advice to people who need some advice. So uh, let's go to a few questions and uh, try to help some people out. Okay. So this question is from Very, Very Tiny. How do I pay attention without losing my mind? First thing that comes to my mind is Go ahead, lose your mind. That's exactly what I was going to say. I was like, you know, lose it. I feel like if you have your mind right now, you, I feel like you got to lose it to find a new one sometimes. And I say lose it. I feel like it's better to pay attention and lose your mind than have your mind being distracted by everything else. I agree. But I also think that um, I'm curious what losing their mind means for them. Like, what does, is it about like, is it about depression? Is it about anxiety? Like, what is the loss of a mind? Is it the loss of peace? Is that what losing the mind is? Because peace is gone for a lot of us already. So what you got to lose? <laughs> that's an excellent point. That, that's an excellent point. I'm glad you brought that up, you know, and I, I want to be thoughtful because uh, that's, I agree with you, but I, I have a harm reduction approach to sanity. It's helped me as an artist, basically. Uh, so like as an artist, uh, as a thinker, I, I kind of want to lose my mind. But I also practice harm reduction because I had a lot of people uh, in my life who kind of dead ended or uh, died uh, because of drug overdoses or not being able to deal. And uh, so harm reduction. It's, it's good to have a place. But it's also good to have a little touchstone, a friend uh a book a philosophy all of those hopefully so that you can you can go in that experimental direction of uh questioning your beliefs but you always have something to draw you back for me that's always been community i agree community and music and that feeling of being with people who understand yeah i feel that like that right now maybe we should go to another question Hi, Greg. It's Pamela Sneed. How you doing? So my question is, how do you process political anger or political grief in the day to day? Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Pamela. That uh, Pamela is uh, a dear friend of mine. We know each other since the 80s. We went through a lot together and she's still a very close friend. And that is an excellent, excellent question. Um, and uh, I know uh, I've learned from Pamela as a poet and a performer that you can channel your anger and rage and grief into art. 
uh, that's, that's actually the stuff of what much of our art is about, uh, which makes that, com that connection back to community. What do you think, Jasmine? Hmm. I, pro I feel like for me, I process so much of my political anger through breathing. I do it through knowing that this empire will fall. I do it through almost like um, I do it through hum humor. Humor is like one of the most incredible things in the world. Like memes, I do it through sharing. I, I definitely bring, again, back to community. I do it through processing it as something that is temporary. I think that when it starts to feel so like there's nothing else in the world other than this feeling of impending doom, that reminder that it is temporary and in motion and in flux, I try to do things that remind me of that, like if that's getting into water, something that reminds me of fluidity, something that brings me back to this idea of this too shall change. That's a great answer. Thank you. You also mentioned breathing. I breathe. Uh, I Well, I, of course I'm breathing because you, you hear me. Uh, but uh, I actually meditate every day. I don't know if you do. Do you meditate? I'm a meditator as well. This Saturday, I'm doing a meditation through East Bay Meditation Center that's all about anxiety. So I'm super excited about that because I think that's been my biggest reaction mode is feeling extremely anxious, like panic attacks like I've never had before. So I'm just like meditation has been that thing to like walk me off that ledge. Yeah, that's very helpful to me, too. Uh, I suspected that might be the case, something we share. Um, let's go to another question. Let's say that excitedly. Let's go to another question. Hi, Jasmine. My name is Hanif Abdurraqib, and I'm a writer and a cultural critic. In my new book, I have an essay about Fuck You Pay Us and being at a Fuck You Pay Us show and really reveling in the way um, that the kind of humor and rage on stage channeled itself into this communal type of ecstasy and joy that felt almost familial. Um, and so my question is, um, how... Do you think the band and yourself and your everyday living um, challenges um, or at least makes the emotions um, that are kind of thrust upon you by the mess of the world at large? Um, how do you make those complex and transform them into something um, vital for yourself and your people, something propulsive and exciting? Oof, oof, oof. That question gave me goosebumps. Wow. Um... In a lot of ways, Fupu was also my first time performing. It was my first time feeling like I had something important to say, that I could even be a leader in that way. So I'm so grateful for Fupu for teaching me that lesson that my voice truly matters. And so I take that into my everyday and the way that I hold myself a little taller. I take that in my everyday when I... Um, when I laugh in the face of disrespect or when um, I let myself fully feel angry, ang angry or sad, or when I let myself fully deep belly laugh, I feel like those lessons come from Fupu in that way. But um, more about like daily political actions that Fupu inspired in me, definitely to take the time to always question where my sense of power is coming from. For example, I could be um, scrolling online and instantly feel this feeling of like, like, oh, why am I not, I don't know, like, why don't I have more followers? Why don't I have, and then take a second and just be like, where would that sense of power be coming from? Would it be coming from an authentic sense of community power? Is it coming from the system at B? Like, where am I sourcing my sense of self in relationship to the power that I want? to attain or I feel like I deserve to attain. So that question definitely leads my, back to intentions, it leads to me being like, okay, well, how can I shift my desire to be in a, from a place that feels more authentic to who I want to be? Or like the, the Jasmine that is at the highest self, who's that Jasmine I've met on stage, that Jasmine that I've met when I had to fucking curse out fucking security guards at the Palladium. Like, how can I honor her when I'm not on a stage? So I guess, why did I just answer a question with a question? That was a beautiful answer. The only thing I have to add in this uh, is that answering a question with a question has a very long tradition. 
uh, out of which I come, and I think it's completely legitimate. <laughs> Um, sometimes you can just put a question mark at the end of a sentence. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a question that still feels so open-ended, you know, like mm -hmm. even though Fupu is kind of disbanded, it doesn't feel like the past at all. That's what makes these questions so hard. Cause it's like a reflection on something that's still happening in my mind or in my body, you know, it's still present so much, but it's not as day to day. I love the work that you do with Fuck You Pay Us. Let's, uh, let's hear a sample right now so everyone knows uh, a little bit about what we're talking about. And you can find this on, um, online on YouTube. heard from Jasmine Niende of Fuck You Pay Us. And now we're gonna hear from Vivian Goldman, member of the Flying Lizards, a current musician, a new album, Next Is Now, Vivian Goldman. Vivian uh, is the professor of punk, known as the professor of punk, also a tremendously important scholar uh, around reggae and dub. I believe Vivian, you're in Jamaica right now, is that correct? I'm actually in Jamaica teaching a Bob Marley course at uh, New York University's Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music right now. That is fantastic. I wish I could take that course. I, I actually want to take any course with you. Uh, I have tons of questions for you and we don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to break it down a bit. You are the professor of punk, a scholar of reggae and uh, dub, teaching a course now on Bob Marley. And uh, you are a musician yourself. Your next album is called Next Is Now, which I'm very excited, very excited for it coming out. I've gotten to hear some tracks, privileged person that I am. And also you are a legend. You were in the Flying Lizards, which was an amazingly important post-punk band. So I have tons of questions. Uh, where do we start? The Flying Lizards was uh, famous for being a unit that actually had no set number of participants. I always like to think of us as the nerds of synth pop because when I was active in the Flying Lizards, there were about five of us and we all became professors. Oh, wow, that's amazing. So you all became teachers. So it was a kind of critical pedagogy. You either went in the direction of critical pedagogy or did you think of the Flying Lizards as a kind of critical pedagogy? Actually, to be honest, to, to the, the founder, David Cunningham, definitely did. He always refused pretty much, certainly in the earlier days, to keep it pure by never doing anything live. Strictly experimental in the studio. That was the whole idea. Using a lot of toy pianos and so on, you know, because they all came out of experimental um, improvised music. I am so grateful for that contribution because <clears throat> your music and that music uh, was so important to my formation. I do want to talk to you about this notion that it, it came up. I was talking to some young people and uh, they questioned the use of the term cultural producer. And I realized that you and I are like of are, are the same generation. And for us, cultural producer, that's, that's an honorific. To be a cultural producer, that's like a good thing. So could you explain... Yeah to uh, people who might not know why cultural producer is a is actually, we would think of it as a good thing. Yeah, like I was saying to one of the crew earlier, a humble cultural worker, you know, and that ties in with punk really, because it was all no more heroes and, you know, none of this sort of velvet rope and VIP rubbish, you know, and that is my cultural formation. And, you know, doubtless you too, we were trained to think of us as, you know, really as good as anybody else, as long as we work hard, make our contribution, do the best we can. We're cultural workers. No matter are we making a fortune or are we not, we're contributing, we're cultural workers, and that's something to be proud of. Thank you. That is an excellent definition. I still sign on to that. I am a cultural worker. 
Um, so next is now. Let's tell us a little bit about your music now. I mean, I, I, I was listening to it. I was thinking that it, it still kind of carries forward from like that post-punk moment. It has elements of the studio work, elements of dub. It also reminds me of that moment. It advances that moment of like Public Image Limited. And it's, it's very hard to place it in a genre. Oh, I love what you're saying. Is somebody writing it down? Um, yeah, you know, Youth, who produced it, um, he was somebody who was living in a squat on the corner of my very communal house in Ladbroke Grove in the early 70s. And I used to try and keep an eye out for him in the Shabines, the reggae sort of illegal after hours clubs, because he was a young teenager. I was already a journalist, you know, covering the punk and reggae scene. So yeah, I, I got to, it's a funny thing. You know how people like to put you in boxes, don't they? People like to put you in boxes. It's always been a little yeah, We're in boxes right now. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Anyway, um, I was sort of uh, called back into writing this book, Revenge of the She-Punks, of which this new record is sort of a manifestation, right? By a reissue of my old music called Resolutionary that happened in 2016, putting together these scattered tracks like, you know, that had been hidden from her story before and people dug it. And then I started getting asked to do gigs. I only realized, you know, when I was writing that book, Revenge of the Sheep Punks, and when I was making that record as yet to be released, Next Is Now, I didn't really, hadn't known how angry I was. Angry about so many things. And uh, it's interesting because when you're making a record, as opposed to writing an article and doing nonfiction stuff as I normally do, you can kind of let it all hang out differently. You don't have to have a footnote, you don't have to justify or validate. And that, you know, that's what I was able to do in the record. I um, very much appreciate the album and its breadth of topics. Um, and um, thank you so much for being here, for your music, for your contribution. It's really an honor to be here with you, Vivian. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian Goldman, for sharing that with us. Now uh, we're going to go back and uh, do some more questions with Jasmine. Hey, Greg. As a Latinx trans person who didn't grow up with representations of adults that had experiences similar to me, the older I get, the more uncertain I am of what it means to be the age that I am. What advice do you have for someone who is currently living through an age you didn't think you'd live to see? Submitted wow. via email by Mateo for Greg. Mateo, that is an excellent question. That is a tough question. Frankly, I've only been able to answer it through experience. Um, yeah, I, uh, as a person with HIV uh, who tested positive in 1988 and who was very, very ill. Uh, and um, unlike many of my friends, unfortunately, who passed away and did not make it to 1996 when the drugs that are keeping me alive uh, were made available. Uh, I didn't expect uh, to be here now with you and uh, I still don't know how to inhabit this 56 year old self. Um, I, I really, you know, that's like a, that's like a cosmic answer. All I can say is um, 
again, that uh, keep in mind that uh, life is worth living. And if you're lucky enough to be around, feel gratitude. Gratitude, gratitude helps a lot. Even in the midst of the worst of times, if you could find something to feel grateful for, uh, that is a very strong enlivener. What do you think, Jasmine? Oh, I think it's very, very true. I think it's like extremely true. I think that gratitude is it. I think it's truly a day by day. And also it's a knowing that there is no blueprint like there that's something that definitely came from punk where it's like i thought i you know like as a suicide survivor someone who's like survived many of times like i think my first time i was like 10 and then like i didn't really think i'd make it to even be a teenager or anything like that and it always just kind of came up of like those feelings coming up when i at least wanted them to so i think that for me what's been making me feel like it's um okay to be in myself and be in this body even if i have run away from it before is um knowing that each day does have something unique to bring to you even if um it doesn't feel that way or like to know that i have been that person but i also have been that person who has seen so much infinite incredible joy and so much love and it's almost like my friend Liza said something really beautiful where she said that um, what keeps her sane, even if I don't quite believe it, I don't quite believe this statement I'm about to say, but she said that for all the depression, all the shit that she's gone through, she's found that um, there's twice as many blessings, that for every negative, there's twice as many in the positive. I don't quite know if that's true. I've, I'm only, I, maybe other people could tell me if it is, but like I at least thought it was beautiful to think that it's possible to think that way. Because I think that one thing that depression really robs of us, and especially for other survivors, is that like, um, is that like, there's so many more ways to think there's so many more thoughts to have there's so many more experiences and lovers and just when it even if you feel like it's not like i guess i'm I'm taking this advice to myself right now too like there's so many more there's so many more multiplicities that are possible thank you jasmine um should we have another question hi greg it's ari banyas and I have a question for you. I actually have many questions, but I'm just gonna ask this one. And it's about our catastrophic moment that we've been living through. And I've been thinking about how it's, it's a moment that has been marked by restriction and refusal and absence and, um, a kind of negative capability. Um, and I was thinking about something that you said when you were describing ACT UP, the model of ACT UP, as one of saying yes. And that got me wondering what you think we should be saying yes to right now, or what you yourself are saying yes to right now, and how that's been or might be productive or interesting um, for this moment or for, or for a way of getting through and to the other side, to some other side of this. Um, also, P.S., can you please recommend um, a good song? That's it. Thanks. Ari, thank you so much. Oh, so great to see you. I'm like a friend, incredibly talented poet. Um, yes, what should we say yes to? Uh, there's two things you have to believe in order to be a, a lifetime activist and continue working. Life is worth living and the possibility for change always exists. Say yes to those two things. Life is worth living and the possibility for change always exists. And as far as a recommendation of a song, Oh, that's like a stumper. It's like asking like, what's your favorite song? What's, uh, um, my go-to song is not actually a punk song. It's um, uh, Abby Lincoln's Let Up. 
uh, that she did uh, on the album Abby is Blue with Max Roach. Because I, I listen to a lot of music uh, and punk is just one idiom I listen to and occasionally wear, uh, like a hat. Uh, but uh, uh, my go-to music right now, still for years, it's always been Abby Lincoln, Abby is Blue, that cut led up. Ari's question about uh, recommending a song, we have to ask Vivian. Vivian, what's your go-to song? Well, I was absolutely so overjoyed you mentioned Abby Lincoln for a start, because in this period, I've been listening to um, her song, Throw It Away, really a lot. Um, and it's been giving me enormous comfort, as obviously always does the music of Marley, which you hear all over the island. Um, but in terms of something... Do you have something, you know, something you put on many, many, many mornings of your life just to get you going? Yeah, for me, it's a song called Soleil by Kassav, a group from Guadeloupe. And if somehow it's biorhythms and it's shifting energy just complements me. When I start hearing it, it just makes me go, whoop, you know, and, and just pumps me up, like you say, gets my foot tapping, gets the old chi moving around. So I would recommend it. Soleil by Kassav. I am on it. Thank you. Jasmine, do you have a go-to song? A go-to song? Oh, my. Jaws Calling by Bad Brains or Jaws Calling. I really like that song. It really puts me in a mood of feeling like, I think that song for me on the album, it feels like it's like that, like that feeling after you've gotten all the rage out, like that feeling of like it's lingering still, but you also feel this like peace of getting something out. So that song is it for me for sure. And then um, My Yeses, I, I just love your answer because I feel like I've that's something I've been having to really work through. It's like, how are you going to feel good about being alive for a long time? This shit's kind of crazy. Like, damn, like, how are you going to feel? I was like, you just have to, that's the activism, I guess. That's the point that you have to keep fighting for. So I don't know. I'm just like, yes to that. <laughs> thank you, Jasmine. Um, and I want to thank you so much for co-hosting and being here. You are wise. You are gifted. And I very much appreciate sharing this space with you. Thank you. I've appreciated it too. It's so great to get to know you, Greg, and the work you do, and yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next week, I'm gonna be joined by Joy Layden. Joy Layden is an amazing poet, a writer, a transgender activist, and uh, one of the most deepest thinkers uh, about Torah and Torah commentary. We're gonna be talking about rabbis past and present, uh, Judaism and its relationship to gender. And we're going to be blessed with the presence of my dear friend Kendall Thomas, who is a, an amazing musician, amazing jazz singer, and also one of the leading theorists of critical race theory. Uh, so we've got it all going on. If you have any questions, uh, November 25th, 8 p.m. EST uh, at. <laughs> So we've got it all going on. We've got everything going on. Scholarship, charisma, questions, more questions. May there never be an end to questions. Thank you.